coming to the last module from this week. Here we will try to understand some ethical and social issues that are involved in face to face and virtual selling. So, I hope you remember the Cambridge Analytica kinds of you know incident uh, that put Facebook in very bad light, right. So, as corporate sandals appear in the media, customers are expecting greater transparency in company operations and more ethical practices. And sales is something where we need to be careful a lot with respect to ethical and social issues. So consequently, sales management has a responsibility to train their sales team or salesperson in ethical selling practices. And salespeople need to be careful about the arguments they use and the kind of you know, inducement they offer when attempting to secure a deal or secure a sale. Ethics are moral principles and values that govern the actions and decisions of an individual or group. So they involve values about right and what is wrong, right? About the conduct that how they are conducting their practices. Selling ethics are moral principles and values that guide behavior within the field of selling and sales management and cover issues such as avoidance of bribery, deception, hard sell, reciprocal buying, the use of promotional indi inducements and to the retail trade and slotting allowances as well. We will learn these concepts in detail. So, ethical selling is influenced by the culture of organization. Creating an ethical climate also improves the salesperson's commitment to provide a superior customer value. The aim is to create an ethical climate within the sales organization that, for example, rejects sales presentations that contain deceptive statements and that perpetuate a climate of deceit among the customers. So, as the following point shows, see how salespeople are under pressure. So, they face a greater number of ethical dilemmas than compared with any other kind of you know job or employees in the group. For example, salespeople are under intense pressure to close sales and ethical issues arise in the face of this pressure. So, everybody wants to close the deal to complete the target to achieve those targets and all. Sales managers are sometimes willing to overlook ethical transgressions so long as the salesperson is successful. So, if a particular salesperson is doing something which is not ethical, as far as the sales are coming, the manager is not, not you know, care careful about that. So, he is not caring about that particular issues. Salespeople operate as the link between buying and selling organizations. And so, ethical conflicts are bound to uh, happen or arise as the salesperson is faced with discrepancies between the interest of both organizations, right. Salespeople are often involved in negotiations that can encourage dishonesty or even exaggeration. Finally, salespeople often work in isolation and the separation between salesperson and supervisor lessens the impact of any ethical guidelines drawn up by the firm. <clears throat> so, there are different key ethical issues that are involved or the ways through which dilemmas are presented to salespeople. First one is bribery, deception, hard selling, slotting allowances and some promotional inducements as well. Let us look at each one of these in detail. Bribery. So, this is the act of giving payments, gifts or other inducements to secure a sale. Such actions are thought to be unethical because they violate the principle of fairness in commercial organizations. A problem is that in some countries, bribes are necessary simply to compete for business. Organizations need to decide if they are to make market in such countries, right. So, it has to be come from the top leadership or the management. For example, GlaxoSmithKline or GSK for that matter was accused of bribing doctors and hospital officials in China to favor its pharmaceutical products. This followed a 1.8 billion uh, kind of you know, pound fine for mis-selling drugs in the USA. Rolls-Royce, another luxury car manufacturer, was also accused of using bribes to sell aero engines. In response, it carried out a program of training to support its anti-bribery code of conduct. So, many popular brands have already been kind of you know associated with giving or using bribery while closing the sales. Another way is deception. A problem faced by many salespeople is the temptation to mislead the customer in order to secure an order. The deception may take the form of exaggeration, lying or even withholding important information from the customer. So, that would significantly lessen the appeal of the product. For example, in Britain, it was alleged that some financial services salespeople missold pension products by exaggerating their expected returns. The scandal resulted in billions of pounds of compensation being paid by the companies to their clients. 
This was followed by over a 12 billion pound paid out by UK banks because of the mis-selling of payment protection insurance. Such mis-selling could occur because financial advisors received commissions from firms for recommending their products. So, however, the Financial Services Authority in the UK has banned this kind of you know, practice. Another example under the category of deception is something which most of us are aware of, the case of Nestle. So, Nestle is a further example of a company that has been criticized for, decept for their deceptive practices. In the 70s and 80s, Nestle sold its infant formula like you know dried milk used to bottle feed babies in the developing world using saleswomen dressed to like, like nurses. Right? So, this gave the impression among the vulnerable target group that the product was endorsed by the medical profession. So, because they are being, they are seeing that you know nurses kind of people dressed up in nurse uh, uniform are selling those infant formula. Despite the fact that the medical profession consistently advises that breastfeeding is the best and one should avoid using these kind of infant formulas. So, following a major boycott of its products, Nestle agreed to honor a quote drawn up by the World Health Organization, which controls the selling of breast milk substitutes. Coming to the next issue faced by salespeople in day to day life is the point of hard sell. A criticism that is sometimes made of personal selling behavior is the use of high pressure or hard sell sales tactics to secure a sale. So, so, like you know, some car dealerships have been accused of such a tactics to pressure customers into making hasty decisions on a compli complicated purchases that may involve expensive credit facilities. Another way is slotting by giving slotting allowances. A slotting allowance is a fee paid by a manufacturer to retailer in exchange for an agreement to place a product on the retailer's shelves. Right? So, you want to take away your competition out of the market, the manufacturer will be giving some extra allowances or which is called as a slotting allowances to the retailers, so that he can put more of your products on the shelf as compared to your pro competitors. So, the importance of gaining distribution and the growing power of retailers means that slotting allowances are commonplace in the supermarket trade. They may be considered unethical since they distort competition. So, even in India, the government tries to have a fair competition. So, we have a competition commission in India and all. Just to make sure that there is a fair competition happening so that a customer will be always at a winning stage. However, because of this slotting allowances, this might be kind of not the case. So, favoring large suppliers that can afford to pay them over small suppliers who may in reality be producing superior products. For example, let us say Coke and Pepsi. If they decide to give those kind of slotting allowances, uh, new startups coming with health drinks and beverages will find it hard to place their products on retailer shelves. Finally, is the promotional inducements to the trade. So, manufacturers like retailers to promote their products rather than those of the competition. So, they therefore sometimes offer inducement to retailers to place special emphasis on their products, right. So, for example, when a customer asks to see trainers, the salesperson is likely to try to sell the brand of trainers that gives them the extra bonus. So, when the customer is not having the perfect knowledge of what he or she is buying, it is up to the retailer to kind of you know which product he is recommending, right. So, if you just ask I want the best shampoo or I want to have a best hair conditioner, the retailer will obviously suggest something from from which he or she is getting more of any kind of you know benefits or profit margins. So, this may be considered unethical since it may result in the consumer buying a brand that does not best meet their needs. So, although salespeople concede that this practice has the potential to lead to abuse, they agree that most consumers have a good idea that what they want and what their needs are and the type of product they want to buy. So, critics counter by arguing that if the practice leads to an overemphasis on a more expensive alternative to the neglect of a cheaper rival brand, the consumer's interest is still not being upheld. Uh, very much example is in terms of again medicine, the field in the field of medicine, where you know a medical store will promote or kind of you know just replace whatever the drugs written by a physician, because he or she knows that you know replacing that particular product with another product which might be you know costing more or the medicines which are costlier, he will get more profit margins from that cell. So, this kind of promotional inducements again affect or present some ethical dilemmas to our salesperson. Again, as we have also discussed about the virtual reality, but again in those aspects also VR, AR also there are some ethical issues if you are using that VR or virtual reality. 
So, virtual reality has a great deal of potential for the betterment of society, whether it be inspiring social change or training surgeons for delicate medical procedures. But as with all new technologies, we should also be aware of any potential ethical concerns that could emerge as a social problems further down the line. For example, there are quite a few I want to list here. What are the ethical issues with using virtual reality? First problem in most of the cases is sensory vulnerability, what it is. So, when we think of virtual reality, we automatically conjure images of clunky headset covering the eyes, ears of users in order to create a fully immersive experience, right. So, there are also VR glows and a growing range of other accessories and attachments. Though the resultant feel might be hyper realistic, we should also be concerned about for the people using these in the home, especially the people who are alone. So, having limited access to sensitive data leaves users vulnerable to accidents, home invasions and you know any other misfortunes that can come from being totally distracted. Because as you are completely in that particular experience of virtual reality, you just forget what is happening uh, you know surround you. <clears throat> Another issue is social isolation. So, there is a much debate around whether VR is socially isolating. On the one hand, the whole experience takes place within a single user's field of vision, including others physically participating alongside them. So, on the other hand, developers like Facebook have been busy inventing communal meeting places like spaces, which help VR users meet and interact in a virtual social environment. Though as argued, the latter could be helpfully utilized by people who are introvert, who do not mix with other peoples as well in the society or the people who are kind of you know feel alone. Uh, uh, lonely and they want to interact or they have want to have someone to speak with. There is also a danger that it could become a lazy and dismissive way of dealing with these issues, right. Instead of getting a help, actual help from friends and families, a customer might be using only VR to you know get rid of this loneliness and all. So, that social isolation is again a important ethical issue. Next is desensitization. It is well acknowledged that being thoroughly and regularly immersed in a VR environment can lead some users to become desensitized to the real world, what it is. Indeed, VR is already employed as a tool to desensitize and emotionally harden individuals against phobias and even military combat as well. However, outside of this supervised use, desensitization could become a danger, leaving users unaffected or less affected by, for example, the acts of violence found in some VR gameplay, right. So, there is an interesting study for this. A longitudinal study conducted by Grizzard et al. in 2016 found that repeatedly playing violent video games lead to dis decreased emotional sensitivity and a lessened capacity for guilt among participants, especially children. Another ethical issue with using VR is overestimation of abilities, right. So, akin to desensitization is the problem of users overestimating their ability to perform virtual feats just as well in the real world. Indeed, a recent study from Stanford University that is Bailey and Balanson in 2017 found that how children often fail to distinguish between their feats in real life and in VR, right. So, from treating their avatars as, as though they are their real bodies to watching their virtual reality doppelganger swimming with orcas and then recalling it as a real life memory. So, they get so immersive in the experience that they forget to distinguish between what is real and what is virtual. And then there is fifth kind of you know problem is with manipulation. So, attempts at consumer manipulation via advertising trickery are not new, but up till now they have been two dimensional. But with the VR where we are talking about 3D, 4D, as such they have had to work hard to compete with other distracted focus when it was 2D. Phones ringing, babies crying, traffic conversations, music, noisy neighbors, uh, these are some examples of that kind of you know manipulation. But with virtual reality, commercial advertisers will have access to our entire surrounding environment, which some psychologists argue has the power to control our behavior as well. So, this will ramp up revenue opportunities for developers who now have literally whole new world of blank space upon which they can sell advertising. So, for v with use of VR, uh, most of kind of you know advertising agencies can manipulate customer behavior by creating an environment, a virtual environment where people are used to kind of you know buy whatever they want and they can you know be sold, they can be sold anything in the market. 
Coming to the last but most important point or ethical issue is privacy and data. Last but not least, the more we merge into virtual world, the more of ourselves we are likely to give away. This might mean more and more greater privacy worries for customers as well. So German researchers have raised the concern that if our online avatars mirror our real world movements and gestures, these motor intentions and the kinetic fingerprints of our unique movement signatures can be tracked, read and exploited by predatory entities as well. So there can be a misuse of whatever we are kind of you know sharing with those virtual environments. So there are a couple of challenges with virtual selling as well. The virtual world is here to stay. Even life is getting back to normal after the recent pandemic. The virtual communities tools that we had to quickly adopt at the beginning of the pandemics, right, like Zoom, MS Teams platforms and all, are now readily available for us forever. So even if the pandemic is over, everybody now is still getting more used to have meetings in online space. Many companies prefer having more than one way to communicate and are frequently letting their customers decide how they want to interact. So anybody if he wants to reach out to customer, they ask whether you want to have a face-to-face -face meeting or is, is it okay that if we can meet online, right? So everybody is trying to explore both the options. The actual selling process, unless you are an online retailer, can be difficult in virtual situation because for some businesses, successfully closing the sale hasn't much to do with intangible chemistry that is shared between a buyer and a seller as it does with the actual product or service you are selling. Additionally, today's buyers tend to be more easily distracted and more likely to multitask in a virtual environment, right? So nobody is very focused. So you have to really try hard to get the attention or retain the attention of your client. It is more difficult for the seller to gauge the amount of undivided attention on the part of the prospective buyer. So as we moved from room to Zoom, that is having meetings in a face-to-face -face physical manner, offline meetings, to Zoom where we are actually having virtual sales meetings, it's important to have key, uh, it's important to maintain that positive engagement between the client and the salesperson. So the key to positive engagement is to plan ahead and arm yourself with tools needed to make the virtual meetings collaborative, interactive, and even fun. Nobody wants to have a boring sales meeting, right? So for instance, there are some tips like always turn on the video so that you can have a good verbal, non-verbal communication with your client. Share something interesting, informative on screen. Slides, stats, videos can help augment your talking points. Use virtual whiteboards, you know, if you want to show something. Collaborate, demonstrate ideas and take notes. Use sticky notes to capture points you want to come back to overemphasize, you know, or emphasize in later phases of your discussion. Practice in advance to be sure your technology enhancement will work, right? So you should not left to the last minute to complete your task, right? Or to plan for your meetings. So how to overcome some of these challenges that we already discussed while uh, doing virtual selling? Remember that people pay attention to two things. First one is the things they care about. And second one, things that are visually stimulating. So either you should talk some sense so that your customers pay attention to, or you should bring something very visually stimulating and exciting to grab the attention of your customers. So following are some points or tips that will help uh, today's salesperson to achieve this objective with their virtual selling meetings. First one is incorporate some movement in both yourself and your content. Watch for your facial expressions. Don't forget to make an eye contact and smile. Use body language and hand gestures to emphasize important points. Be aware of timing to keep people engaged with you and use more visuals and less text, right? So that do you make you bring some very visually stimulating content to retain the attention and take the discussion forward. So with this kind of, you know, tips, one can really achieve good results, whether it's a face to face meeting or it's a virtual selling meeting that has been arranged. So with this, we completed this module and this week's learning about the emerging trends in sales. Thank you.